And now for <coughs> some of the same and also something completely different. First of all, I would like to thank um, Emil for inviting me and, and Matthew. And um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I am, as some of you may know, a theorist. And so I'm going to be engaging a bit of what we still call critical theory. Um, Salome obviously has been a figure of fascination. And uh, in the 19th century, her gender seems particularly to serve as a focal point, as many people have noted. Um, so I'd like to think today about literary responses to Salome, mainly in the French context. And among other things, to think about how gender is configured in The Dancing Princess. But I don't think it's enough anymore today to sternly remind us all that women in the 19th century fall into one of two categories. On the one hand, uh, the Victorian angel of the home, sexless, maternal, and pure. And on the other hand, the devouring female, murderous, femme fatale, deadly temptress, and so on. Why women were thus delimited in the 19th century is a question that's never been fully answered, though many have tried. Such a binary of extremes, angel, deadly seductress, is certainly alien to most women who rarely see themselves in either category. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> Thank you. Freud, who writes fully from within the Victorian mentality, is in this regard as incomprehensible to women as they clearly were to him. What does woman want, he wrote to Fleece, was the only question he was never able to answer. Interesting, because all his major patients were women. Infamously, he referred, as you know, I'm sure, to women as enigma, a riddle, and even more infamously, the dark continent. I mean, the, the sexist, racist overtones to that are quite fascinating. His Medusa is another Salome or Queen of Sheba, or Delilah, or Whore of Babylon, or Sphinx, who, by the way, is reminiscent, you know, in those uh, images we saw of the Panthers. Um, or the narcissistic woman, or the English slash Shakespearean version of Joan of Arc, or she who, in the Judeo-Christian culture, is never quite out of hearing range, Eve. So why to repeat this binary structure for the woman? the woman. It is a question that's preoccupied numerous historians, probably the best known of whom is uh, Stephen Marcus, 1966, the other Victorians. And it's a question somehow symptomatic of the long 19th century. And it certainly was long. Virginia Woolf's Orlando, you'll remember, upon seeing the dawning of the 19th century, notes that dismal gray clouds have moved in. Clouds so dark that one fears they are never to be lifted. The inhabitants of the 19th century were not, on the whole, a cheery lot. And the clouds remain pervasive, I would say. <clears throat> but it seems to me that what the French writers I'm going to be talking about have in common when they describe Salome is a fascination with power. And in particular, with power when it is gendered female. For what do Medusa, the Queen of Sheba, Delilah, the Whore of Babylon, the Sphinx, the Narcissistic Woman, <coughs> Shakespeare's Joan of Arc, and Eve have in common with Salome? The power to destroy, and to destroy a male in particular. One might say that all of these figures, and God knows there are a lot more, from the perspective of the male artists and writers I'm going to be looking at, are like moths attracted to feminine power with a concomitant fear of being consumed by their intensity. It's a sort of flirtation with <coughs> that rapidly descends into misogyny and suppression as if powerful women uh, could be neutralized by being somehow ekphrastically controlled through a text or a painting or a poem, film, play, and so on. And we've been seeing that all day today. So I wrote one of my first articles against René Girard's reading of the Salome story. Girard, I argued 30 years ago, erases difference and thus history in his reading. Everybody on his account is finally everybody else. The perpetrator is really the victim, Salome is really her mother, and so on. 
The communal oneness of which Girard speaks allows him to argue that order can be restored in a given community through sacrifice. I've always found this theory, including its notion of mimetic desire, particularly politically dangerous. And I'll be happy to talk about that at the question and answer period. In any case, bent on de uh, demonstrating difference, we were then, after all, in the heady, pardon the expression, heady, Derridian era. Uh, I went on to note that it is, a fa in fact, Girard who exiles and decapitates. He chooses the Gospel of Mark and ignores that of Matthew. He overlooks a number of rivalries at the time, including, by the way, a very likely rivalry between the Baptist and Jesus, or at least between their followers. And Girard elides difference in general between mother and daughter, as I said, between Mac Math and Mar um, <coughs> Mark and Matthew, between the Romans and their colonized subjects, between Herod and Herodias, because their names are genealogically linked, which is silly because everybody is called Herod something, or Herodias something, Herodias something. Between religious sects, that is, between pagan, Jewish, and neo-Christian groups, and so on. Curiously enough, however, in my youthful indignation at a famous and brilliant, if worrisome, critic at the time, I don't mention that Girard omits gender from his discussion of Salome. It's a glaring omission that I myself commit in my own response. But I now believe that the difference in gender also functions as a stand-in, or let us say veil, for an issue of power. Like Antigone, there's incest, as we've heard, in the House of Herod such that an initially facile distinction between state and family, a distinction that, as Judith Butler points out in her Antigone essays, structuralism, for example, relies upon, that facile distinction implodes by virtue of the plot. Creon, you will remember, is also Antigone's uncle, and her mother is also her grandmother, because her father is, after all, Oedipus. Salome's mother, bigamously married to her husband's brother, uh, is like Antigone's Creon. Herod is also Salome's uncle. And as in the Antigone story, the Salome tale raises the question of where power lies. Did Salome <coughs> want to kill the Baptist because he spurned her advances, as Wilde would have it? Was she merely an obedient child acting at her mother's bidding, as Flaubert seems to suggest? Or was she desiring her mother's desire, which was the somewhat Lacanian reading that I had proposed, contra Girard? The Salome story, in other words, echoes the tragedy of Antigone in that it pits the power of the state against that of kinship, incestuously blurs them, and thus muddies the place of power, both political and personal. And also, of course, sexual. In distinction to Antigone, Salome's power over Herod is sexual, particularly in the 19th century versions. The Antigone of Sophocles <coughs> engages no sexuality. Her power is enforcing Creon's hand. And by the way, this is also true of Anui's version of the Antigone play, uh, where you could say Antigone is sort of having a teenage crisis, uh, which is what leads Lacan to call her the little fascist. For Moreau, Flaubert, Mallarmé, and Rismans, Salome primarily raises the question of feminine sexuality as if a woman's power were always and only sexed and vested in her sex <coughs> seductive abilities alone. So we're back to the femme fatale that so fascinates the period. Indeed, Herodias herself, as we've heard, is portrayed as oversexed in most of these texts. In marrying Herodias, Herod, as we know, has violated Mosaic law. The synoptic tradition gives John's harsh criticism of this unlawful second marriage as the reason for his execution, and of course, Wilde emphasizes Herodias' hatred of the Baptist for this reason and calls her a whore. But I'm not going to talk about Wilde today because Jean Peterson is going to be doing that next. Even as we heard this morning, Josephus is harsh with Herod for the a bigamous marriage, although he does not see it as the principal reason for John's death. So the sin is double, as we know. Um, 
So the point is that in 19th century renditions of the story, female sexuality is accentuated to explain the counterintuitive reality of a woman with agency. So whether it's the refusal of sexuality, like Malarmé, which uh, becomes in itself a kind of perverse sexuality, or an overt one that's desi <coughs> designed to dominate an aging tetrarch, female sexuality functions as the explanation for female power and thus mutes the terror of something more frightening still, power writ large and not necessarily sexual in a woman. In the late 18, uh, 1980s, God, I'm not that old, um, Barbara Johnson, who was one of the editors of the New French History, called me and asked me to write on Salome for that volume, and she said, I don't know why you keep ignoring gender. <clears throat> so, Indeed, uh, a chapter that I'd written on Salome in my first book had just come out, and again, gender was sort of pushed to the side. Um, I agreed to write on that, and uh, but even there, I think I pushed aside gender. I mean, I have some theories about that, but I don't think they're very interesting. Um, but I think the real point is that at this point in, shall we say, history, it's boring to intone about gender in this context when it's clear that the 19th century culture in France could not understand any more than Freud could how a female subject could be vested with power. Lethal, if it wasn't sexual. Lethal sexual power was all that <coughs> they could arrive at as an explanation. These great seductresses that mesmerized men and then destroyed them. So there is an exception and I'm going to get more specific in a minute, if you'll just allow me to continue in my little sort of theoretical presentation. Um, Malarmé is an exception because his Herodiad is a virgin. Uh, like Freud Narciss uh, on narcissistic women, which is a very interesting article, by the way, Herodiad in Malarmé is impervious to male sexuality. She suffices herself. Freud's Medusa, you will remember, who turns men to stone with her gaze, is really a displacement, the inventor of psychoanalysis tells us. She's a displacement from castration and or the vagina dentata. Women's sexual power, again. And there are many analogs. Schiller, for example, in his retelling the Joan of Arc story, has her fall in love with a general near the end. And as soon as that happens, she can no longer fight and loses all her strength. She lies moaning and ultimately dying on the battlefield. Uh, it's almost as distorted a story of Joan of Arc as uh, Shakespeare. I mean, you remember in Shakespeare, Joan of Arc is pregnant, so-called. <coughs> so I'd like to bear these aspects of power and its gendering in mind as I look at these Salomés to whom I'm going to turn now. What's intriguing uh, for just a little more contextualization about Salome are the periods during she be which she becomes an object of interest. And I'm not going to go into that because we've heard about it. Um, but let me say that the 19th century fascination really begins in 1842 with Heine's Atatrol. Here she becomes the Salome that Desessant in the Rismal's novel was to recognize, beauty without morality. She's lost all of her political, historical, religious meaning, symbolizing rather the pure ideal of great seduction without scruple, without restraint, with cruel indifference. Her literary presence in French arts of the 19th century, however, is nearly as incestuous in terms of influence as is the inbreeding in the Herodian family. So here we go. So we have Atatrol which gets translated into French. In 1876, when Flaubert was immersed in his study of Salome, and you know, if you know Flaubert, that he didn't mess around when he was doing research. Um, Flaubert writes to Madame de Jeunette, the story of Herodias, as I understand it, has no relation to religion, which is very interesting since it's, in fact, generated by a problem of religion. What captivates captivates me, he says, is the official face of Herod, who was a real prefect, and the ferocious face of Herodias, a type of Cleopatra 
and Madame de Maintenon. Let me just say in passing that there we have two more powerful women who are blurred into the ferocious Herodias, who is essentialized into an equation where female means sex, which in turn means danger. Flaubert's letter was written in June of 76, shortly after the Salon displayed the Moreau paintings, Salome dancing, which we've seen before, but we're going to see again. And you see, actually. And uh, the apparition. How do I do? Enter. Enter. I think I'll leave that on. Um, notice that the figure of Salome was the same in both pictures in terms of its um, arms. I don't know how to go backwards. How do you go backwards? Back. 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 Where, where's back? That's your close oh, yeah. right. Um, that's the original Salome dancing. That's the close-up, and this is the apparition. And all I'm saying is that the position of the body is the same. Um, but in Salome dancing, she, you will notice, looks regal. And if you can see the face, um, uh, she, her eyes are almost closed, as if in a kind of tranquility of ecstasy of some sort. But in the apparition, most scholars describe her as looking on in horror at the severed head of the Baptist before her. But you could also see that facial expression as commanding, as if she is creating the vision of the head, you know, like in a Disney magic movie. Um, not that they're not all that. Um, and triumphantly gazing on her victim. I think Moreau probably wanted both expressions at once. So these are the paintings that will appear on Des Essences' wall, uh, bookcases, rather, in his novel, in the novel by Rhys Mons. In April of 76, then, Flaubert had also just come back from Pont l'Evêque and Honfleur, where he had gone to do the research for another story in the same collection, A Simple Heart, Un Coeur Simple. Um, which is in the collection of uh, Three Tales. And he, again, he writes to Madame de Jeunette, and he says, do you know what I feel like writing after this? The story of John the Baptist. The nastiness, he says, vacherie, which is even worse, of Herod toward Herodias excites me. It is as yet only a dream, but I really want to develop the idea. So Flaubert was first inspired by Herod's nastiness to Herodias, then by the latter's ferocious face, and finally, by the Moreau paintings of Salome, which he went to see at the Salon. The decadence for Flaubert lies in the vicious and jealous, jealous Herodias, and not in Salome, who looks like the young Herodias to Herod. When Flaubert Salome asks for the head of the Baptist, she speaks like a child. But Moreau himself, I hope you're following this incest that I'm trying to literary incest. Moreau, however, was in himself inspired to paint Salome because of a novel by Flaubert, which was an earlier one, namely saint uh, 1862. And you'll notice there's a partial assonance between the two names. A novel that presents itself as historical, it's the story of Carthage and a Carthaginian princess, and originally written in what Flaubert considered to be a biblical style, which was, by the way, a disaster. Every sentence began with and. <laughs> it is Orientalist in the extreme. And I mean Orientalist in, you know, the, the way we've been using it today, the sort of Edward Said way. It was Moreau's favorite novel, and he loved the ornate prose Flaubert used, particularly to detail the attire of the princess Sarambou. So let me give you a small sampling of that. Her hair powdered in a violet sand and gathered in circles according to the style of Canaanite virgins seemed to make her larger. Tresses of pearls attached to her temples dangled near the corners of her mouth, rosy as an open pomegranate. Remember, we're talking about saint -Ambeau. On her breast was an assemblage of gleaming stones imitating by their medley the scales of a marana. 
Her arms, garnered with diamonds, emerged naked from her sleeveless tunic, which was spangled with red flowers on a black field. Beneath her ankles, she wore a small chain of gold to regulate her gait, and her great coat of purple, fashioned from unknown material, trailed behind her. So this is a description worthy of Beardsley, and echoed a few, few years later by Moreau's vision of Salome. So in other words, it goes, Salambo, Moreau's love of Salambo and using the description to do his paintings, Flaubert going to see the paintings and deciding to use the paintings as, <laughs> as an as inspiration to do his own Salome. Um, not note on the one hand from that description of, of uh, Flaubert's on Salome, how the on uh, Salambo, sorry, how the jewels add to the mes mesmerizing effect of the princess. She's quite literally dazzling, and you will note she is expensive. She's covered in diamonds. She shares with Baudelaire's dandy the perfect uh, uh, perfection of attire and insouciance toward both the wealth she so brilliantly embodies and uh, to those lesser mortals along with the reader as they gaze at her entranced. We're a long way from a simple heart and poor Felicité, a kind of angel of the home. But also note that Flaubert compares her opulence uh, Salambo's opulent clothing to the scales of a fish, and not just any fish. The morena is a voracious moray eel of the Mediterranean, long and pointed as a needle, excessively dangerous with terrible bites. It grabs, now I have this from an encyclopedia, not the Wikipedia. So, so listen to this. It grabs its prey by surprise and wraps its body around it until it is efficiently, sufficiently flattened to be swallowed whole. Or it swallows it up and, as the encyclopedia entry breezily puts it, quote, the other option is to tear apart the victim and eat it one bite after another. The morena continues this same tome, spends most of its time hidden in the caves and rock crevices on the bottom of the sea. It attacks like an ambush predator and produces a protective mucus, which, <laughs> indeed, which can, <laughs> <laughs> which contains toxins, I hope not. <laughs> and it likes to eat sharks and barracudas. You get the idea. The danger of the human female emerges. She ambushes her victims by surprise, devours her prey, hides in dark crevices before she springs to attack, and is disgustingly slippery and generally toxic. Now, Moreau had already been struck by the story of the Baptist with um, La Décollation de Saint Jean Baptiste, the, the beheading of, of John the Baptist, a work by Puvis de Chavannes, which was displayed in the 1870 Salon. Okay, now I'm going to be very brave. Ah. Um, here in Puvis' narration, you'll note, Salome awaits the beheading. The charger, which is another translation for the platter, is ready for its purpose hanging from her languorous hands. But her clothing is less than inspiring, especially compared to what I just read to you, and no fabulous jewels bedeck her. And her face looks almost medieval, like the evil virgin in the unicorn tapestries. The near-naked slave, who is the black executioner, reminds the viewer of the exoticism and racism that mark the tale for Western eyes. In 1874, the Salome figure had also captured Moreau's attention because Baudry, as we saw earlier, uh, <coughs> had presented a draft for the foyer at the opera in Paris, which was precisely the dance of Salome. Whereas Moreau began with an interest in St. John's story, his attention turns more and more to the dancing princess. Out of 120 drawings on the subject, 70 are on Salome alone. As Julius Kaplan points out in his book on Moreau, the influence of Salambou is discernible in the high headdress and flowing robes Flaubert describes and the high vaulted sanctuary of Tanit containing a many-breasted goddess. 
This we saw, we've seen more than once, but this is what he's talking about. And I would add, there is a matter, the matter of the profuse trail of jewels in Moreau's painting that act <coughs> like those of Salambour, as Flaubert describes them. Thus, inspired by the Carthaginian princess, Moreau paints Salome dancing in oils and the apparition in color. Although critics were somewhat offended by the pieces, more than 500,000 people came to see the Salon, and in particular to see Salome. That's a lot of people in the 19th century, right? Um, Flaubert was overwhelmed by Moreau's vision and began his research for his Herodias the same month of the same year. To his niece, Caroline, he writes, now that I'm finished with a simple heart, Herodias presents itself, and he says, and I see, and he underlies see, clearly as I underline see, the Seine, the river Seine, I see the surface of the dead sea glistening in the sun. Herod and his wife are on a balcony from which one can glimpse the golden tiles of the temple. So we've come full circle. Flaubert's verbal depiction of Salambeau inspires Moreau's paintings of Salome, which in turn help motivate Flaubert's interpretation of the Salome story. And it is these two works by Moreau that grace Des Essences bookshelves in his opulent retreat in Against Nature. That novel was published in 1884 and was called The Breviary of Decadence by Arthur Simmons. The work itself marks Riesmal's break with the Zola group with its rather rigid insistence on naturalism. Riesmal felt he was suffocating in the Zola circle, so it's ironic that this novel describes a basically claustrophobic hothouse uh, literally as well as figuratively, of rich objects and rare flowers in a home that's a fortress, <coughs> of a wealthy and reclusive aesthete that is désessante. And by the way, Zola was appalled by this novel. Désessante loves Salome, and in particular Moreau's depiction of her. Riesmal's description of her is certainly the most explosive in the novel, in which, if truth be told, not much happens otherwise except for the death of a bejeweled turtle. Here is part of Des Essentes, and we've heard some of this, describing Salome dancing before Herod, uh, which you have in front of you. Amid the heady odors of perfume in the overheated atmosphere of the basilica, Salome slowly glides forward on the points of her toes, her left arm stretched in a commanding gesture, her right bent back holding a great lotus blossom beside her face. Um, I'm going to skip some of this because I think I have less time than I thought, right? Um, so she has strings of diamonds that glitter against her moist flesh. Her nipples are hardening. Her breasts are rising and falling. She's got triumphal robes sewn with pearls, patterned with silver. Uh, every chain is a precious stone. Everything's ablaze like little snakes of fire swarming over the matte flesh and the tea rose skin, this part I have to read, like gorgeous insects with dazzling shards, mottled with carmine, spotted with pale yellow, speckled with steel blue, striped with peacock green. So it's more, right? What's curious here, you'll notice, is the superabundance of nouns, adjectives, and endlessly heavily charged sentences that Riesmalls deploys to describe Salome, who, paradoxically enough, is also in this painting nearly naked. Everything glitters and dazzles, hardens, and sparkles. And the Quiris, C-U-I-R-A-S-S, -S, is likened by Desaissant to gorgeous insects. A description that echoes, of course, Robert Salome, who is compared to the Marana. Riesmal substitutes rainbowed insects and swarming snakes of fire. One could have a field day here expounding on the implications. But don't worry, I'm not going to go there. Whether dark continent, evil temptress, femme fatale, wo woman seems particularly in this 19th century to be closely connected not only to the primitive, <clears throat> and the animal kingdom and to evil, but also to deadly beasts of prey. Did I do something? 
Well, actually, I'm finished showing pictures, so that's okay. But of course, we already knew that. I haven't said anything that we didn't already know about the situation of women in the 19th century. But this is particularly bizarre. Perhaps Muses des Essentes, the artist Moreau had been thinking of the dancer, the mortal woman, he says, the soiled vessel, ultimate cause of every sin and every crime. He then launches into a gleefully misogynistic and rather sadistic reverie about how in the, quote, sepulchral rites of ancient Egypt, a dead woman was laid out on a slab of jasper, and then the embalmers, quote, with curved needles extract her brains through her nostrils, her entrails through an opening made in the left side, and finally insert into her sexual parts to purify them the chaste petals of the divine lotus flower. So everything is coded, right? Des Saint, the character who gives a dinner where all the food is black to mourn the temporary loss of his potency, Temporary is in quotes. <laughs> Des Saint is fascinated by the woman who is able to reignite the old tetrarch, even while <clears throat> Des Saint describes her as sapping the morale and breaking the will through her hypersexuality. Now, this is my favorite part. Salome decides Des Saint is exactly like the most beautiful of new objects for him, the locomotive. Hers is, quote, a catalepsy that hardens her flesh and steals her muscles, the monstrous beast, indifferent. I think we've heard this line, irresponsible and insensible, unquote. She poisons, like Midas, everything she touches. But notice that Rismals, through Des Essentes, once again, never really describes the dance at all. He's as if infected by the static quality of the painting. Indeed, catalepsy seems to be contagious. From the frozen figure in the painting, to the hardened steel of the locomotive, to the steel-like quality of Salome's flesh, as Des Saint imagines it, uh, to even his ornate and gemmed vision of her, she who is known for dancing conjures up paralysis. It is Des Saint who, ironically enough, has the Medusan gaze and the Midas touch. Salome becomes what Michael de Codin has called a woman flower of evil. What a difference then from the Herodiade of Malarmé. By the way, he uses Herodiade not only because he's conflating Salome and her mother, but also because it's like the Iliad or the Aeneid. It means the house of. His Herodiade stands in for his obsession with the blank page the impossibility of writing, and the impotence, in a larger sense, of the poet. She is neither bedecked with jewels nor smolderingly sexual. On the contrary, she says, I love the horror of being a virgin. Mallarmé writes to his friend Casalis in 1864, I have finally started my Herodiade with terror because I'm inventing a language that has necessarily to stem from a very new poetics and this is a famous remark, that I might define this way, to paint not the thing, but the effect it produces. So the point here is that this is to depict something without a material referent. So we have to bear this in mind as I continue here, because Mallarmé is interested not in the by then cliched dance, not in the jewels, not in the fundamentally evil aspect of Salome or her mother or both. Rather, he sees her as whiteness, as sterility, silence. She stands in for the impossibility for him of writing, the impossibility of creation. Um, <coughs> she is with him as if hamletized within kind of reveries of ice. And that's why he writes a famous paragraph about the dance, which I will spare you a whole reading of. It's also very obscure. But what he says when he goes to a, 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 dancing, a dance concert, he says, let it be known that the ballerina is not a woman dancing, that within those juxtaposed motifs she is not a woman, but a metaphor that summarizes one of the el elementary aspects, a poem detached from all instruments of the scribe. 
So you notice how there is a moment there, but there's no material referent, and that's what he likes about it. So what he sees in the dance, Malarmé, the text I've discussed so far, and the painting, paintings, uh, do not. The dance of Salome in these previous texts and paintings was somehow unimaginable, undescribed. She danced, as the Bible puts it, in the paratactic prose of Matthew and Mark. Uh, she's not even mentioned nor named, as we've said, in Luke or Matthew and Mark. But in Rismal's The Dance, as we've seen, is limited to a description of Salome's attire and the movement of her arms and one foot, but never the dance as <clears throat> a full moment of action. Paradoxically enough, Mallarmé's abstraction of the dance gives the reader an idea of the attempt to write without, as we used to say, a signified. Indeed, the dance inspires the poet because there's no concrete referent, as I said, in the dancing. So the dance is an analog for the kind of writing Mallarmé wants to achieve. Writing, as he used to say, is like a watermark, a poem is like a watermark on the page. It's detached from all instruments of the scribe. An idea of writing, to quote from his Herodiade, is to be like a moribund star that will no longer shine. So it's all about the impossibility of writing, the impossibility of writing in the way that he thinks uh, language should work. Uh, and Salome, who is a virgin, who is sterile, who wants to do nothing and wants to just die, is his metaphor for that. So if Mallarmé succeeds in deautomatizing de writing from its crass materiality, as he put it, it is by pro proclaiming that there is no dance and no woman dancing. Here, Salome's dance becomes the, as if the blind spot of writing uh, in its own repression. I'll explain that if anyone's interested. Riesmal's paragraphs of dialogue as well as descriptive prose, precise as they are, not only fail in rupturing the limits of the novel, as Riesmal himself had demanded, but fail as well because the prose maintains a blind spot in relation to itself. Moreau's painting, static as painting is, is in fact closer to Mallarmé's vision because it is a writing through the language of the body, a writing that is frozen and that puts John the Baptist at the center uh, of this unfinished work. I am, writes Mallarmé to Casalis, incapable of putting two words together. Mallarmé was famously uh, suffering from writer's block almost his entire life, and the Herodiade was an attempt to describe, among other things, that crisis. The white page continues to haunt him, and if writing is feminized here by Mallarmé and thus rendered quote, static and sterile, and if his use of the feminine continues to produce a certain misogyny, the question for Mallarmé is nevertheless the impossibility of writing and the necessity of expressing that impossibility by the very means that are impotent, words. Salome becomes then a metaphor of such sterility and not a dangerous female seductress. She refuses to be touched. She says, it is for myself that I flower. I am a woman of the desert. I am night white with ice and cruel snow. The project of Herodiad, writing about how pure writing is impossible, was itself, of course, impossible. By 1865, Herodiad had become nothing more than a hollow memory, says <coughs> the poet. In 1866, the poem again becomes for him pure and magnificent. At least, he says, I hope so. But the pure poetry for which Mallarmé strived all his life is indeed pure but utterly unattainable, necessary and yet sterile. The poet was to work on his Herodiad for the rest of his life, but it was never completed. The last, I still have some time, right? I was supposed to get an hour, you know. Yeah, so I'm hurrying. Uh, the last part of this work is called the Cantique de Saint Jean, the, the hymn of, 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 Saint, of John the Baptist. And it's forma formatted, as some of you may have seen, as a narrow column, like the neck that will soon be severed from its head. The Cantique represents, of course, the Cartesian separation of thought from the body. I am awaiting something unknown, says Salome. Herodiad. 
The void lurks constantly here. Religion is indeed a constant temptation. This is clear in the Marami text. Poetry, for him, becomes its willed substitute. Like the Baptist, the disappearance of the poet for Mallarmé, for reasons quite different from the disappearance of the narrator for Flaubert, is necessary, as far as Mallarmé is concerned, for art to appear. The poet, like his Hérodiade, must die in the desert in order to allow poetry to survive. I mean, he believed this. You know, I'm not making this up. Every word of a poem, he said, is the death of every other. Salome is then the personification on the one hand of pure beauty that flowers in the desert, unseen and doomed, and she is what Mallarmé called the perfect poem, the watermark that I mentioned earlier, almost invisible, but the imprimatur of what is true and genuine. Dance here serves as the metaphor for thought. When the dance thinking metaphor fails for Mallarmé, and the dancing princess as well, he will turn to music as another hope for a sign without a referent. He was very interested in uh, Edgar Allan Poe's commentary that music shows us glories beyond the grave. Speaking of no concrete referent. Un coup de dé, a roll of the dice, I guess, perhaps his greatest work, attempts to turn language into a musical score. And a score, of course, is comprised of signs without immediate material reference. The dance of Salome, then, is described in Dizzy's sense abundantly rev uh, referential prose, or Flaubert's historical and sartorial precision, or Moreau's equal precision of vision, is of no interest to Mallarmé. His Hérodiade is a kind of swan song, as the nurse uh, puts it, that is, uh, Hérodiade's nurse. Herodiad of the clear diamond gaze, says the princess of herself, O oh, final charm, yes, I am, I feel, alone. No wonder the great Mallarmé critic Jean-Pierre Richard says of this poem, all of the Mallarmé and Herodian myth can doubtless be understood as the tragedy of the gaze. In other words, there is nothing to see, there's nothing to look at, the gaze is not returned, there is no referent, and nor is there supposed to be one, and, and the gaze permeates this very strange poem. The pure gaze, as the beheaded Baptist is imagined to say at the end, lives, quote, up there where an eternal cold can endure only among the glaciers. Doesn't this make you want to read Madame Mena? No. So Salome, as we know, is a Maccabean princess who, like many other figures in the Second Testament, symbolizes both the old Judaic tradition and the so-called New Roman Empire. Well, it's not new, but... She's also a pagan of sorts whose laws and power the Second Testament at once affirms initially and rejects ultimately. Salome, Herod, and her mother are in opposition <coughs> to John, Jesus, and the gathering multitude worshiping both prophets. The punishment that will come to Herod and his line is emphasized in Luke by his stern judgment of Herod, even before mention is made of John's execution. For the issue in the Bible is not the dance of the young princess, but the wrong-thinking, blasphemous, and bigamous Herod and his immoral wife. Parataxis, wrote Auerbach, is a series of phrases that are ma that made sense of and connected through ideology. You cannot understand why Roland, in the Song of Roland, dying, throws down his glove to God unless you understand feudal hierarchy. The Bible doesn't describe or dilate on Salome's dance. That is left to each era to flesh out. The 19th century chooses to loose its misogyny and masculinist insistence on the figure of Salome, filling in the gaps with an ideology that follows it and compensating for the biblical severity of prose with an overabundance of detail. Salome fascinates the likes of Moreau, Flaubert, and Mismans because she responds so convincingly to the patriarchal notion that woman is powerful only because she is highly sexed. The most obvious example of that, for example, is the Hottentot Venus, who came to Europe in the 19th century, if anyone wants to talk about that. Hence the focus on Salome's dance. 
It is as if by showing textually the dance, these modern texts fulfill their own prophecy that woman is depraved and will render depraved. The sterile, virginal Hérodiade of Mallarmé loosens the focus on the dancer in his essay by claiming that what matters in the dance is its aerial writing, which disappears, its production of poetry by virtue of its disconnection of references, from references. As such, and I'm nearing my conclusion, Mallarmé ushers in what I've been suggesting, that the use of gender for metaphorical purpose having to do not with gender at all, but with the quest for creation and thought are couched in a given era's assumptions. Thus, what Mallarmé makes possible is what was previously veiled. Power in a female subject, quite apart from her sexuality, quite apart for her, from her sensuous and tempting dance. So I would say that Mallarmé opens the way to the present, wherein what counts is less gender now than it is the triumph of power with the evil that allows for and the ensuing <coughs> hopelessness of the pure creative enterprise. This is a prospect more frightening because it allows for more dilation still to the machinery of suppression, regardless of gender. It is in this sense that power promulgates and it is in this sense that Salome's dance is first, is a throwback to a time when only men could encompass and counter hegemony. Today we can perhaps claim to be thinking in a manner less anchored in gendered roles, such that we see the Salome of Wilde, Flaubert, and Rismans in the same way we look at somewhat endangered species at the zoo. But, I do not say this because I think we're better off. Dangerous power is aestheticized today differently, but it continues to attempt to neutralize it and displaces it onto other figures, Muslims, foreigners, religious zealots of foreign conviction, blood wars, viruses, and so forth. Such attempts will fail because the political weight of power structures today is vested in money, profit, hegemonic, and global information. The dance of Salome and the power she bears is very little compared to these. And perhaps that's why we return to her now in a kind of nostalgic move to a time when the worst threat was the daughter of Eve. Thank you. <laughs>